Uh, I'm James from the Restart Project, uh, and I'm just here to introduce the session. Uh, so good morning and welcome to the third session of Fixed Test UK 2020. Uh, in the first session last week, uh, we heard from Josh Babarinde, founder and CEO of the social enterprise Cracktip. Uh, Josh inspired us to think about repair as a blind process. Uh, in the sense that it doesn't discriminate, it only discriminates against the incompetence of repair, not against what your past might be. Uh, and we hope that those words will continue to inspire us throughout the whole series of events we're running until the 9th of July. Uh, you can hear Josh's speech on our website, therestartproject.org, um, as part of our most recent radio show. Uh, so far, we've also explored the right to repair in the UK. Um, and in the last session, we also talked about the many repair networks growing across the UK and how we might all work together to strengthen the repair movement as a whole across the country. Before we get started today, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so please note that all sessions are recorded and will be shared. Um, so if you don't want your uh, name to appear or to appear on the session, that's fine. Uh, just make sure that your camera is turned off and your microphone is turned off. Uh, you can turn off your camera and mic or turn them on um, by using the controls in the bottom left of the video. Um, if you're not speaking, please do keep your microphone off. Um, and if we get too many people in the session, it may be the case that we have to turn all cameras off as well, just to save bandwidth. Um, as speakers, Chris and I will be able to turn people's cameras and mics off uh, ourselves just to make sure we don't get too much background noise. Um, there is a text chat that you can see on the right of the video. Not sure which way that is for you. Um, feel free to use this text chat at any time during the session to ask questions, to make comments, um, or to ask for technical support. But if you do need um, technical support that we can't help with in the chat, there is a question mark icon in the top right of your screen. Feel free to click that icon if you're having trouble at any time, uh, and there will be technical support on hand for you. Uh, we are taking notes today in a separate uh, on a separate website um, that someone will be posting in the chat shortly. Feel free to have this open in another window or another tab, uh, and we will take notes together collectively um, in that. So it's easier to catch up on the session for people who arrive late or don't want to watch the whole recording when it goes live. Um, in, that, uh, in those notes, we also have a talking stack. So this is where we will keep a list of people who have questions for Chris during his session, um, just so we can keep the order. So feel free to add your questions directly to the talking stack in the notes that Vanessa's just posted in the chat. Um, we're thankful to Nesta and DCMS who funded both editions of Fixed Test UK, both in 2018 and this year. Um, but getting right to it, today I'm delighted to introduce Chris Muller, uh, who will be taking us on a deep dive into the world of electrolytic capacitors. <laughs> Chris is a retired electronics engineer and telecoms engineer who is heavily involved with community repair. Not only does Chris run a repair cafe in Cottenham, he also sits on the Cambridge Area Repair Cafe Coordinating Committee uh, and supports the spread of repair uh, events across the county. He's also organized four repair cafes in rural Ghana, uh, which were the first in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and, as well as sitting on the International Standards Committees for Off-Grid Electricity. Uh, so Chris, I'll hand it straight over to you. Welcome uh and thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Um, yes, um, well, I've uh, widened my brief slightly, actually. I'm going to talk about capacitors in general and actually how they are applied and how you uh, identify uh, where there are likely problems with them uh, in a, a typical piece of electronic equipment. Um, so um, to start with, I've got a, a few slides um, which I will uh, put up. Um, let me just see if I can do this. Um, and uh, oh, I just need to uh, need to share, uh, and I need to share this window, and hopefully you'll be able to see my presentation. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, um, uh, re really widening the brief that James has given me very considerably. Um, 
<clears throat> let me uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, the perspective on electronics in general in Africa. Um, uh, and uh, it, it may be a shock to you. I mean, I'm a, a high-tech enthusiast, as I expect most of you are. Um, uh, and I think the things you can do with electronics are absolutely fantastic. Um, but uh, that isn't the perception everywhere in the world. Uh, and if you ask people in Africa what they think about high tech, uh, they, they, they say it's rubbish. Uh, and I, I look at the kind of things they buy in Africa and they are terribly built. Um, and you say, well, you know, why do you buy this stuff? Surely it would be worth paying a little bit more for something that would last. And they say, well, our experience is that even if you pay more for it, it still doesn't last. So why waste even more money on it? Is so this is my first slide. Um, so, yes, um, uh, I, I'm shocked running repair cafes in, in Ghana. I asked people, how long have you owned this item? Uh, and the average answer is six months. Um, uh, and when you think that they have paid probably several weeks salary for this piece of electronics, um, that, that really is quite depressing. Uh, and I think as uh, electronic engineers, you know, designers have a, a huge uh, need to up their game and make things more reliable. The trouble is, uh, you, you go to people in Africa and uh, you know, they will always go for the cheapest, uh, and that is a problem. Anyway, um, the, 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 uh, the important message from this is, uh, well, okay, if it's a DVD player that's blown up, well, okay, you can't watch DVDs, big deal. But if you live in the desert and it's a solar water pump, it's a very big deal. Um, uh, and you know, it could actually put your life at threat. And very understandably, people in Africa don't like having to depend on high tech to work because there are so many problems with it. So that is the, the thing which I'm campaigning to fix. Um, and uh, one of the ways of fixing this clearly is looking at capacitors. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, let me just uh, summarize what we see uh, coming into the repair cafes. We see lots and lots of failure modes for electronics. Um, uh, and you can summarize these as uh, over temperature and over current, which uh, typically causes semiconductor failure or capacitor failure, the theme we'll return to again in a moment. Um, and also thermal cycling often breaks solder joints. Over voltage is a big problem in many parts of the world, not too bad a problem here, um, unless you plug in the wrong power supply. Um, but uh, that causes uh, either semiconductor failure or capacitor failure. And then, of course, in, in Africa particularly, we get lots and lots of corrosion problems uh, and mechanical abuse problems as well. Um, uh, and uh, I've hardly ever seen a fuse in Africa. It's always been taken out and strapped with a bit of wire. And people don't realize that in many cases, the fuse is actually there to save consequential damage. And by the time they bring it to us with the uh, wire strapped around the fuse holder, a whole load of other things have been broken as well. Um, so uh, that, that, that's just a, a couple of slides on repair cafes in Africa and what we can learn in general for repairing electronics from that. Um, so coming down to capacitor issues in particular, um, uh, three distinct um, capacitor issues arise, um, and I'll talk about each of them in turn. Um, safety capacitors um, that, uh, that uh, often blow up, um, motor starter capacitors that often go soft, um, and electrolytic capacitors that, that very often fail. Um, and just a reminder, if you're uh, testing any uh, large value capacitor with your multimeter uh, or even just handling it, remember that it can hold a charge for quite a long time. Uh, and if it's a high voltage one, give you a nasty shock. So always discharge a capacitor by shorting the two terminals together uh, before you handle it. So safety capacitors, uh, there, there are two kinds. Uh, there are class X capacitors. Uh, I, th I think maybe you can see my mouse here on the screen. Um, class X capacitors exist across the live and neutral. Um, they are usually there to stop uh, uh, high frequency noise being pushed back into the mains. Um, and uh, they're very commonly found in uh, household equipment with a motor. Um, uh, sewing machines would be a classic, but also drills and uh, um, food mixers and so on. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, they typically fail short circuit. Uh, and uh, uh, on the next slide I've got, uh, there's, there's a picture of what they look like. Uh, Chris, can I just uh, jump in with a question that we've had in course. the chat? Um, so Jen is asking, um, what is a capacitor? 
Um, so I'm wondering whether it might be good to start with a, a very basic broad definition before. Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay. okay. Well, Sorry. Right. Yes. Um, uh, capacitors uh, have the the characteristic that um, uh, they hold charge, which means that um, if you put an AC signal through them, they have a very low impedance to a, a, an alternating signal. Um, that means that you can use them to smooth out DC in large values. Um, and uh, uh, the smaller values are used to separate an AC signal from the DC uh, voltage that's there to operate the electronics. Um, so, so two quite distinct roles for capacitors. One, um, smoothing out uh, DC and uh, removing noise. Uh, and the other, uh, separating a signal that you are, are interested in uh, from uh, DC voltage that's there to power electronics. Um, uh, the, 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 the cynics have referred to capacitors as a voltage pulse to current pulse converter, which is another way of looking at it, I suppose. Um, capacitors uh, on a, a, a computer motherboard, you'll see thousands of small capacitors everywhere because uh, microprocessors have very spiky current demand uh, and uh, power supplies don't like supplying very spiky current. So a capacitor across the supply uh, smooths that out. Um, and uh, uh, around a modern microprocessor, you need to have capacitors within less than half an inch of the capacitor uh, in order to smooth current pulses out. Um, anyway, safety capacitors here. Um, the class X capacitor we're talking about uh, exists uh, to, to stop you pumping noise generated by your motor back into the mains. Um, uh, and as I say, you'll, you'll find them in most uh, uh, equipment that has motors with commutators in. Class Y capacitors are different. Um, they're, they're typically of smaller value. They exist um, between the uh, live and neutral uh, of the uh, main supply and um, exposed metal work or anything that you might touch. Um, uh, and they are there to, uh, to, to, to swamp uh, leakage capacitance uh, in transformers. I can talk about that in a moment. Um, so um, the, uh, the, the, the typical lifetime of a safety capacitor is about 20 years, which means that we're seeing quite a lot of 20 year old sewing machines coming in um, with uh, blown up uh, safety capacitors. Uh, and uh, typically what you'll see is something like on the left of this picture. This is a you know, cracked and charred. Um, uh, sometimes uh, it'll be impossible to read the, uh, the value of the capacitor. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, a typical replacement modern capacitor you can see on the right there. Um, this is uh, thanks to Mark Irving who sent me these pictures. Um, uh, fortunately, the uh, capacitance value of a safety capacitor is not critical. So if you can't read the value on the, on the uh, remains of the old capacitor, it's probably not a problem. Um, uh, and uh, you'll find, uh, as uh, you can see on the right there, the typical value of one of these safety capacitors is about 100 nanofarads, uh, 0.1 microfarads. Uh, and they will always be a capacitor that have various safety markings on them. Um, you can see uh, various certifications here, uh, VDE and CXX, I don't know who that is, and so on, where these capacitors have been through rigorous tests to make sure they can survive spikes on the mains. Um, you'll see critically uh, on the uh, top right corner, X2, the marking on the capacitor, this says that it is suitable for going across the line. Um, X2 means it's for consumer. You'll hardly ever see X1, um, which is uh, industrial quality. Um, and uh, interestingly, these capacitors usually fail short circuit, obviously causing a very high spike of current, um, which is what uh, cracks them and blows them up. Uh, and it's quite common for someone to come in with a sewing machine uh, in some distress saying it suddenly went bang and there was a cloud of smoke. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's just that this capacitor has blown up and replacing it and the uh, sewing machine will be as good as new. Usually failure of uh, X capacitors is very obvious. Um, the, the Y capacitor, um, which uh, sits between the mains and exposed uh, metalwork or anything that you might touch, um, it usually fails open circuit and uh, failure is probably not obvious but also the failure is unlikely to stop the equipment working. Um, 
So uh, if we look at uh, some wire capacitors, uh, this is a, a picture of, uh, it's actually a, a carbon monoxide detector that someone stripped down. Um, uh, and we can learn quite a lot of useful things from this. Um, the class Y capacitor has been highlighted. You can see it's uh, an epoxy coated uh, ceramic capacitor, um, maybe typically uh, one nanofarad to 10 nanofarad, something like that, um, uh, high voltage. You can see, uh, if you can see my mouse moving around the screen, uh, you can see there's a, an insulation boundary. Uh, to the left of the uh, picture is the, uh, the mains voltage stuff. To the right of the picture is the low voltage stuff that you might conceivably touch. Um, and the only things, the only two things in this case straddling that boundary are this Y class capacitor and the, the transformer at the top. Um, so uh, on here we see this Y class capacitor that we talked about. Um, uh, we've got two electrolytic, aluminium electrolytic capacitors here, um, which we will talk about in some detail. Um, there are also some ceramic capacitors, which uh, we needn't worry too much about, and they hardly ever fail. Um, interestingly, on the right, there are three capacitors here. Um, they may be tantalum or they might be niobium. Um, uh, and th th they're there to provide a, a, a small, um, a physically small high capacitance value. Uh, so um, uh, as we talk through this, I hope that you'll get a feel for how you can look at a, a typical circuit from a piece of electronic equipment and say, oh, yes, I understand how this is arranged. <clears throat> Moving on to motor starter capacitors. Um, the, the, these uh, are not as common as they were. Um, you'll typically find them in uh, floor standing fans and things like that. Um, uh, larger induction motors. Um, and uh, these typically fail by going to a lower capacitance value. Um, they, they might be four microfarads, 10 microfarads, something like that. Um, uh, and uh, when you test them, you find that there may be only half a microfarad or one microfarad. The symptom is that the fan runs slowly. And it's very tempting to think, okay, this is because of seized bearings in the fan, but uh, it's also very likely to be because the capacitor has gone soft. Um, uh, and the solution is take the capacitor out, easy if it's got these fast on connectors as on the one on the left, uh, measure its capacitance. Uh, and obviously if it's anything wildly different from what's printed on it, then you need to, um, to replace it. Um, you, you can test the value with a capacitance capable multimeter. Um, switch mode power supplies um, are uh, really very, very common now, almost ubiquitous. Um, I've chosen this circuit diagram of uh, a very typical one. This has all the elements that you would expect to see. Um, uh, and um, we, we will just go and highlight each of the bits so that uh, you, you can feel familiar with it and feel your way around. Um, on the input, we've got a fuse. The fuse may well blow. If the fuse blows, it's probably because something else has blown. Uh, then we've got an X-class capacitor across the line. Um, uh, and uh, an inductor which provides noise filtering. This is to stop this circuit pumping high frequency noise back into the mains. We then get a, a bridge rectifier. Um, these do sometimes fail. Um, they run quite hot. Um, uh, and uh, if, if one of these diodes fails, then uh, the fuse will blow. Um, this particular one has a, a, a negative temperature coefficient thermistor in there as well to provide extra protection. Then we come to the high voltage storage capacitor. Uh, these, these do quite often fail. Um, and um, uh, that, that, that's a key component to look for. Um, and uh, we'll talk in a little while and, and my demo will show you how we can check the value of this um, typically in circuit. Um, then um, moving on, the other things we see, we see a power MOSFET here. This will usually be on a heat sink. Um, uh, and this is obviously switching uh, what will be af after this has rectified it. This will be 350 volts up here. Um, so this is switching 350 volts DC through the primary of the transformer. Um, then there's the transformer itself. Here is the insulation boundary um, between the mains hot stuff and the, uh, the safe to touch stuff. Um, and you can see that there's, there's the transformer to provide the power going forwards. 
uh, and there's an opto isolator to to provide feedback um, to make sure that the voltage stays uh, as uh, stated on the output. Um, sometimes the uh, the opto isolator is replaced by another winding on the transformer. Uh, that's a slight variation that you may see, um, or, or or some other technique. But uh, usually uh, the opto isolator is much the commonest. Um, and then on the right you have a very simple circuit. Um, which uh, just uh, rectifies this high frequency, puts it into another storage capacitor, which is another key component to look at. You can see this is quite high capacitance, low voltage. Um, and um, uh, that, that's the second most likely capacitor to fail after this one. Um, so these are the key elements. Um, uh, and you will find this in virtually every switch mode power supply you come across. Um, if we look on the next one, this is a picture of a very typical switch mode power supply. Um, and I hope based on the, uh, the schematic diagram that you've just seen on the previous uh, slide, that you can identify each of the components that I've just talked about. Um, here is the, uh, the X class capacitor X2, you can see there uh, across the supply. These are the supply pins, probably live, neutral and earth, something like that. Uh, here's the fuse. It doesn't look much like a fuse like you might be used to, but it is a fuse. Um, uh, and it needs to be replaced with one like it. And uh, I must admit that typically in a repair cafe, we don't have replacement fuses like this. Um, but that may be something you need to think about stocking. Um, here, here's the, uh, oh, where's my mouse gone? Oh, my mouse has just disappeared. Oh, here it is. Um, here's the uh, filter capacitor, uh, the filter coil, uh, the inductor. Uh, and uh, I can see here two Y-class capacitors um, uh, from the input to, to Earth. Um, can you see my, uh, my mouse, uh, James, because it keeps disappearing? I can see your mouse, yep. Okay, um, uh, it's, oh, here it is. It's back again now. Um, okay, so now I'm hovering over the bridge rectifier. Um, this turns the 250 volts AC into 300 and something volts DC. Oh, my mouse has disappeared again. I don't know where is it. Oh, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. Oh, here it is, back again. Um, and uh, that then gets stored in this huge capacitor here. Uh, I can see, I, I can't quite see the value there, but it's probably something like um, a couple of hundred microfarads at 400 volts. Um, uh, and uh, this is a, a fairly highly stressed component uh, and, and very likely to fail. When it fails, um, I would expect this fuse to blow. So don't replace this fuse before you check the capacitor. Then we have the power MOSFET here, which is uh, switching the main, the rectified mains at high frequency, maybe 100 kilohertz or something like that. Um, uh, and uh, there's another uh, wire class capacitor here and another one here, I can see. Another small ele electrolytic here. This is unlikely to fail, but it might do, I suppose. Then we come to the transformer. Uh, which uh, uh, reduces the voltage from a uh, high frequency switch 350 volts down to uh, 12 volts or whatever it is that this uh, power supply is uh, hoping to deliver. Um, mouse has gone again, here it is. Uh, we have a, a wire class capacitor across the insulation boundary. This is all hot down here and cold up here. Uh, and here you see the opto isolator providing feedback uh, from the low voltage side to the high voltage side. Then we have um, uh, somewhere in here, I can't see it, there's a diode. This may well be the diode. Um, uh, and then um, uh, we've got three electrolytic capacitors here. The, these typically will be connected in parallel um, uh, and they provide the smoothing on the output. Um, why do they use three? Well, um, because it's more flexible space-wise than just having one big one, but also um, three capacitors tends to have a lower ESR than one big capacitor. ESR is the equivalent series resistance, which is uh, uh, one of the characteristics of an electrolytic capacitor that we need to worry about, which interestingly is not printed on the can of the capacitor. Um, and I'll show you a way of measuring that shortly. So that is my answer to the question, why are there three low side electrolytics? Hopefully you've seen all of these components uh, in the picture now. Uh, and when you get faced with this, you won't have a reaction of horror. You'll say, oh, yes, I understand this. I know what's going on here. I know how to find my way around it. Um, uh, and uh, I know how to debug it. Um, I'll, I'll show you a more complicated one uh, in the demo in a little while. 
before we move on, Chris, um, yeah. just a couple of questions from the chat. Well, uh, actually, sure. a couple of comments and a question. Mm -hmm. um, so Mark pointed out that winding three is for low voltage supply after startup. Um, I think I was referring to the switch mode power supply. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then I think uh, when referring to the photo that you had up just now, uh, Mark again suggests that the small cap in the primary might fail a lot, especially on routers that are on twenty four seven. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Um, oh, oh, you mean this this little one here? Yes, it could do. I suppose yes. Um, um, it, it, it certainly is worth checking. Um, and yeah, then indeed. there's also a question from Ben, who's asking, "What is ESR?" Uh, equivalent series resistance. Um, a pure capacitor um, at, at high frequency would look like a short circuit. In reality, um, there is some resistance in the wires, some resistance in the aluminium foil inside the capacitor. Um, so it, it does indeed, even at the highest frequency, have a resistance. Um, it's not a perfect capacitor. Um, so ESR, if you like, is a measure of how non-perfect a capacitor is. In the same way as an inductor, um, uh, ideally is a perfect inductance, but the reality is that the winding does have some resistance as well. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a demonstration of ESR in a, in a little while. Brilliant. Um, Thanks, Chris. Oh, and for everyone uh, in the chat, if you find that the chat isn't working for you, isn't refreshing, or you can't post messages, you may need to refresh the browser window. The chat sometimes has a glitch, so just bear that in mind. Sorry. Thanks, Chris. Sure. Okay. So um, electrolytic capacitors come in several different shapes and sizes, uh, short, fat ones, long, thin ones, surface mount ones. Um, uh, and um, uh, quite often you'll find yourself in a situation uh, doing a repair where you have a capacitor of the right voltage and value, but it's the wrong shape. Um, uh, and that, that is an obvious challenge. Um, it's very difficult in a repair cafe to have a selection of all the kinds of capacitors you could possibly need because uh, you've got uh, voltage and uh, capacitance shape and size um, and also operating temperature and we'll talk a little bit about operating temperature as well um, because um, uh, evidently there are different kinds of electrolytic uh, electrolytes that are used inside these capacitors um, it's a liquid or a gel um, and um, uh, that there, there, there are electrolytes that are good at 105 degrees C and there are electrolytes that are not. Um, and the electrolytic capacitors inside uh, switch mode power supplies typically ought to be rated 105 degrees C because power supplies typically run quite hot. Um, so th those are the things to look out for. Um, so um, we've had a lot of discussion on the forum. You may have read it um, about uh, the lifetime of electrolytic capacitors. Um, if you look on the RS Components website, um, the uh, capacitors they offer, they quote lifetimes of uh, usually 2,000 hours. Um, uh, uh, and uh, the very best ones you can buy in the market uh, have a lifetime quoted at 10,000 hours. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that your piece of electronics is definitely going to fail in 2,000 hours um, because uh, that 2,000 hours is quoted at the maximum uh, temp operating temperature at the maximum working voltage uh, uh, and the maximum uh, current. So uh, a, a good ethical uh, electronics manufacturer will um, rate his capacitors very conservatively if, if he thinks that the, the highest voltage they're ever going to uh, endure is 350 volts then he'll put in 400 volts or 500 volts not 350 volts. Um, but of course you know, higher voltage um, costs more, uh, long lifetime costs more. Uh, and uh, one of the challenges is that, uh, you know, when you buy a piece of electronics in a retail store, it's impossible for you to tell how conservatively the manufacturer has rated the components inside it. Um, all you can really do is uh, rely on the fact, okay, this is a reputable brand. I think this, this brand will be worried about uh, maintaining their brand reputation. And therefore I trust that they, uh, they, that they will uh, rate things conservatively. And if you buy something which is from some brand you've never heard of, um, then don't assume that anything is, is, is derated conservatively and don't assume that you're going to have a long operating life before you have to take it to a repair cafe. Um, unfortunately, my experience in Africa is that almost all electronics comes from brands you don't recognize, uh, and therefore it, it really is very difficult to tell whether something is going to last or not. 
Um, so um, if you find that a capacitor has, uh, has failed, um, uh, replace it if you can with one which is more conservatively rated so they don't have to bring it back to a repair cafe again or a restart party. Um, uh, it, 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 you may be able to put another capacitor in parallel with the old one. It's, it's almost invariably um, uh, that a, an electrolytic capacitor will fail open circuit. Um, so you may just be able to put a new one in parallel with the old if you can't remove the old one. Oh, sorry. Um, so how do we identify failed electrolytics? Um, um, my favorite method is using a component tester, and I will show you one in a moment and, and show you how I do it. Um, <clears throat> And uh, um, obviously, uh, th there are many multimeters out there now that are also capacitance capable, um, uh, and uh, they can also measure capacitors. Um, looking for bulging tops and bottoms, I, I, will, I will show you um, uh, some of those um, so that you can identify those. Uh, and sometimes, you know, if it's been really bad, um, there'll be nothing left except a couple of leads coming off the printed circuit board and a lot of mess around the place. Uh, and the uh, the aluminium can will have gone flying off into the yonder. Um, so um, that that really is the end of my um, uh, uh, my PowerPoint. Let me see if I can get my wife in here to hold the uh, hold the uh, camera so that I can do a demo. Hi there. Can I have your help, please? Oh. While there we're we waiting for that, Chris, um, yeah. I think there are a few more questions that we could probably go through. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at the so talking stack. Um, so a question from Ugo, uh, and I think Janet was interested in this as well. Is the experience you described in Africa referring specifically to what you've seen in Ghana? Um, or where else are you referring to if not just Ghana? Uh, okay. Um, I, I have quite a lot of contact with people in Kenya, um, uh, and I think the, the problems there are very similar. Um, they are they are trying to um, uh, Im impose a law in Kenya which says that uh, electronics has to be quality controlled to be allowed to be imported, um, but um, uh, 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 un unfortunately that's simply a, another excuse for a customs agent to take a bribe. I think, um, but the principle is there. They're trying. <laughs> so um, so there we go. Anyway, um, okay. thanks for okay. that. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, another couple of questions, if that's yeah, okay, sure. just before we move on to the demonstration. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a question here. Um, are you referring to uh, maybe uh, the person who asked this question can provide a bit more context, but someone's asking whether you're referring to um, reputable manufacturers of capacitors or devices. I think Ugo asked that question. Um, well, um, um, uh, Yes, I mean th th there are there are um, well-established brands, things you might recognise, you know, Panasonic, Nichicon, um, uh, and so on. Um, but um, uh, many times it's quite difficult to identify the brand of a capacitor. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, who knows whether it's it's reputable or not. Um, uh, certainly, only reputable electrolytic capacitor manufacturers quote product lifetimes. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, and finally, uh, Joe asks, uh, is it useful to replace with a capacitor from an old uh, print? I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Joe. Are you happy to maybe type in the chat? Um, uh, well, don't, don't replace a capacitor with one salvaged from an old piece of kit because that may be nearly blown. <laughs> it may have had its 2,000 hours or whatever. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, no, you know, use a new one. It, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, it's penny pinching to recycle old electrolytics, I'm afraid. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so so, so um, what, what I wanted to show you, just a few things. Um, let, let me show you my favorite piece of test kit. Um, uh, can I show you? Uh, now, uh, the, these exist um, on, um, uh, there we go. Uh, that they're available on eBay um, from several different suppliers. Amazingly, they only cost about 15, 16 pounds ago. Um, and I think they're absolutely fantastic. Um, and um, let me show you how I can, uh, let me just test a capacitor uh, and, and, and show you how it works. Um, I, I just stick it in the, uh, the, the uh, socket, uh, press the button, uh, wait a moment. Um, and uh, hold on, if we can get it under the display. Uh, it says testing, testing, testing. Uh, and there you can see this capacitor is 3262 microfarads. 
it's a good capacitor because it has a very low equivalent ser series resistance of 0 0.01 ohms um, uh, and that, that's tremendous. Okay, um, very, very easy way to, to test uh, a capacitor and get the ESR. Um, and uh, let me uh, put in a capacitor which has been zapped. Um, th this is uh, one that's been recovered from a piece of kit. Press the button. Uh, it is meant to be a thousand microfarads at uh, 25 volts. Testing, testing, testing. Uh, and uh, it says uh, no unknown or damaged part. So there you go. Um, that's, Chris, that's... could we uh, get a slightly more zoomed out view of the of the uh, zoom out? Device? There you go. Hold on. Whoops. So oh. See the full thing. And struggling stru 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 to put it in front of the camera. There you go. Perfect. Um, Thank you. Okay. The the ones that are on eBay at the moment come in a non-transparent box. They've they've changed it slightly. Um, uh, they've also upped the price. This one I bought on eBay for six pounds. Believe it or not. Um, uh, and uh, just to show you, I mean, I I've added my own leads to it. By the way, um, I don't know if you can see that. Um, Oh, hold on. There you go. I've got my own leads with crocodile clips, which I've soldered on, so I can I can uh, connect it to various other things. Um, just to give you an idea of the flexibility of this thing, uh, I just put in a MOSFET um, uh, and, and and run it on the MOSFET, and you can see that it says immediately that this is a, an NMOS MOSFET. It shows the protection diodes. It shows which is a great gate and so on. Even shows the uh, parasitic gate capacitance. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, the, the, the key thing I wanted to show you using this is that because it uses a very low um, voltage to test capacitors, you can perfectly successfully um, test things in circuit. Now, um, if you can just zoom out and, and, and take a look at this. Um, here's a, a switch mode power supply that I've taken out of the back of a flat screen TV. Um, it looks a bit horrendous, but actually when you start looking at it, all of the components that uh, we saw in that previous um, uh, uh, picture of a switch mode power supply are there. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, at the bottom of the picture, actually, uh, you can see that there's there's two uh, class X capacitors. There's a fuse slightly disguised in a little black plastic sleeve, um, some filter components, bridge rectifier here. Um, there you go. Just zoom in on that. Um, on a heat sink, um, and um, then um, some high voltage MOSFETs. Whoops, where are we? Here's the camera here, uh, also on the heat sink. Uh, then you see the high voltage capac storage capacitor. Oh, well, it's a bit high. <laughs> Hold it still, and I'll move this. Okay, uh, the high voltage storage capacitor, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, and then uh, an integrated circuit that's doing a whole load of the switching. The key thing to note is that the, the, the uh, let's just zoom out on this. Uh, hey, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> put, just put it down there and I'll, I'll move it. Okay, so uh, all of this area is hot, all at mains voltage and its sole purpose in life is to generate 350 volts DC. Uh, you'll see this capacitor on here, it says 150 microfarads, 450 volts, 105 degrees C. Um, Supposing I suspect this capacitor, uh, let me just put my uh, uh, my leads from my circuit tester on it, press the button, and if Anne can uh, we look at the, the screen here, it says testing, testing, testing. Okay, it says 137.6 microfarads and 2.8 ohms. Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, for 150 microfarads, 137 is probably adequate. Um, so, okay, so now we have 350 volts DC there. Uh, and then we have two transformers, both using the 350 volts. Um, you can see that, that the whole thing is duplicated. It's two power supplies using the low voltage side. Uh, transformer here with uh, feedback uh, opto isolator and uh, a regulator and some smoothing capacitors. And over on the other side, a different power supply with a different transformer. Um, uh, and again, a load of capacitors. Um, uh, I should say uh, that uh, if, if, when I started to debug this, I found that three of the electrolytic capacitors had failed in different places on the circuit. And it was quite a surprise that actually um, uh, the, the TV was working at all. Um, so um, I found my way around it quite easily. Um, if I uh, uh, 
put put a, a a couple of leads onto a capacitor. Let me just uh, pick one at random. Um, press the button. This is doing an in circuit test. Um, you may be able to see that uh, on the screen uh, it says testing, testing, testing. Okay, nineteen hundred and three. Uh, oh, it says nineteen hundred and three picofarads. That's worrying. Let me just do that again because uh, I think it's. I think this capacitor is good. Um, that was probably just getting my fingers actually. My fingers might well have a capacitance of 1903 picofarads. Um, okay, testing, testing, testing. Let's see if we do better this time. Uh, testing, testing, testing. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, oh dear, no. Well, I failed on that. But anyway, um, the the key thing is that it's it's really a, a very good indicator. If you put your leads from your uh, te component tester across the capacitor and you get a stupid value, then uh, the capacitor is definitely suspect. Now, um, another way to identify suspect capacitors apart from actually testing them is to, to, to look spot doming. Now, it's a bit hard to see this, um, but if you look at the top of this capacitor, you may be able to see that it's bulging a bit. I don't know whether you can see that. Um, if I put something black behind it it might be easier to see um, whoops there you go you can see it's domed slightly um, there you go if i look at a regular capacitor that is not domed here's one that looks just slightly concave on top um, uh, and doming is a, a, a very uh, easy way to identify failed capacitors it's not absolutely reliable you can get domed capacitors that still work uh, you can get undomed capacitors that are blown up um, but um, uh, a doming is a, a very strong indicator. Um, sometimes capacitors um, have a, a flat top like this one, um, uh, uh, and they won't dome. They typically have a pressure relief uh, valve underneath, uh, and you get doming on the bottom. Uh, it's a, it's a slight, quite slight doming here. But here you can see this one, which is blown up. It's got a split on the side, which is another you know, good indicator. Where's the camera? There you go. Um, you can see the, the covering has split. Um, and there's also some electrolyte mess around it as well, um, which is a very strong indicator that this has blown up. Um, so so um, physical inspection can um, also identify um, a, a, a blown up capacitor. Um, Chris, yeah. just before we move on, thanks for everything so far. We've got a few technical questions flowing in. Sure, so I thought it would be a good time to address some of those before. Okay, um, I think I've pretty well finished the demo. So uh, shall I just put the camera okay. back the way it was? Um, uh, and we'll have a go at answering your questions if I can. Fine. There we go. Um, okay. Uh, uh, can people make sure that all the questions are in the talking stack in the notes and I'll just work through those? Um, perfect. Okay, so the first question uh, that we haven't answered yet is, uh, do these testers check for leakage and potential future breakdown? Uh, uh, someone's planning on building the Carlson capacitor tester, which checks on these similar value capacitors, but if these do it, these may, that may save, uh, may, may save some time. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 the, the, these uh, testers that I'm demo demoing here, uh, they can only really show capacitance and DSR. Um, I have no idea how you would test for future lifetime or remaining lifetime of a capacitor. Maybe other people know that, um, but, but, but I, I don't. Um, it'd be an interesting thing to know, actually. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to be able to say, I can promise this capacitor is going to last another five years. I'd love to be able to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, okay, perfect. Uh, and if the person who asked that question, if you want to follow up, please do put it in the chat or in the etherpad. Uh, the next question was from Ben. Uh, touching on a point from Katie, I think, mm -hmm. which was, uh, no, from Keith, apologies, uh, which is how and when do you have to discharge capacitors? Um, um, uh, okay, uh, uh, only uh, capacitors that, that uh, have large values. I mean, uh, I'm talking about 10 microfarads or above. Um, uh, and uh, definitely discharge them before uh, testing them with a multimeter. You could zap your multimeter quite easily. Um, by, by put, putting in an undischarged capacitor. Um, particularly important if you're taking a, a, you know, a, a motor capacitor off the mains, it could easily have 300 volts across it. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, do, do make sure, short it out with a screwdriver in that case. You'll get, probably get quite a, a bang and a, a, a spark, but uh, don't worry about that. Um. Okay, <laughs> that sounds very dramatic. 
Um, okay, uh, and again, any follow-up comments to that, please stick them in the chat. Um, the next question uh, was, do you need to remove the bad capacitor from the board to test with the device that you were using, or can you test it straight from the PCB? Uh, you can you can test it in the PCB. Um, uh, yeah, if 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 you uh, put your uh, tester across a capacitor that's a hundred microfarads, uh, and it says it's a hundred picofarads, uh, then you can be pretty sure that yeah, you know, whatever other circuitry there is around it, it's faulty. Um, but you know, if 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 you, if you test 100 microfarads and it says i don't know it's it's 50 microfarads um then it might be that it the answer's being skewed by whatever it's connected to uh, and of course if you've got three capacitors in parallel each of 100 microfarads you'd expect to read 300 microfarads off all of them perfect thank you uh, some follow-up question uh, comments from janet and ben about discharging mm -hmm. capacitors janet oh, yeah. says we'd probably recommend uh, a different method to discharge at community repair events, perhaps a less dramatic one. Um, um, well, you, you you can put a resistor across, um, but um, yeah, uh, 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 in, in, interestingly, uh, one of the main dangers in microwave ovens, um, where they they typically run at uh, maybe fifteen hundred volts, um, yeah, they have a, a storage capacitor in there, usually you know four four point seven microfarads or something like that at 1500 volts and uh, at the instant you turn them off they will indeed still have 1500 volts across that capacitor um, there ought to be almost invariably is a resistor which discharges that capacitor um, but because it does it in a non-dramatic way it uh, it may take uh, maybe 20 seconds to do that um, uh, and and that is something to be very aware of when when testing a microwave oven uh, and of course if that resistor had failed then that 1500 volts may stay on there for hours. Um, so, so that is something to be very cautious of with microwave oven. In fact, it's the main sa safety issue with repairing a microwave oven. I think, yeah, and definitely one of the reasons that I think at most community events yeah. I've come across microwaves aren't really allowed. Yeah, um, well, quite, quite wise, yeah. Yeah, uh, perfect. Okay, um, uh, a question now um, about um, testing capacitors without desoldering them. Mm. So Ugo asks, um, are there any testers available that come with a feature to test capacitors without desoldering, without having to attach your own wires? Um, well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the system that I've got here, um, yeah, uh, it, it's a bit hard for me to show because Anne's now gone. Um, uh, oh, that's not too bad of you, is it? Um, if, I, uh, if I see if I can do this, demonstrate it. Um, well, in fact, you know, he, he, here's one I can do. Um, this one has got some easy clip-on terminals. I can. This is in circuit, and I press the button, um, and uh, it will give me a reasonable value. It's meant to be 150 microfarads, uh, and it tells me on the screen. You don't know whether you can see that that it's 137. Uh, there you go. Oh, maybe you can see it. Maybe you can't. But anyway, oh, there you go. Just about see it. There you go. More or less. Yeah. Um, so so yes, and that's in circuit. Um, obviously, the reading, uh, maybe it isn't really 137 microfarads, maybe it's 150, um, and maybe if I took it out, I would get a more accurate reading. But at least it gives me some indication that, yes, there is a capacitor there, and it is more or less doing its job. Okay, great. Um, and just on that note, uh, Andreo in the chat from mm. um, Barcelona uh, says that, in his opinion, it's um, important to use a professional tester, and he kind of links to one in the chat. Um, which costs about eighty pounds, um, oh. but recommends that is uh, a good way to do it. Um, oh. And Ugo also pointed out that Sergio from Resources Milan um, mentioned the design and schematics of a product he's currently designing uh, to do this. And for anyone who's interested in that conversation, there's more on the Resources forum, and we can link to that if people are interested. So, uh, yes, I mean I, I'm keen uh, to work with with Sergio on that. Um, I think I think uh, we we could do a useful crowdfunded product there. Brilliant. Uh, fantastic. Uh, okay. Uh, looking through the questions. Um, we have a question here. I'm not sure who, oh, from Janet. There we go. Uh, who's asking whether we can return to the issue of manufacturers, capacitors, and product lifetimes. Yeah. And what could be done to help consumers pick better products uh, and raise the bar in terms of capacitor ratings? Is there a role for inserting this issue into eco-design standards? Um, yeah, I mean, 
uh, at the moment, the only way to, to really know whether electronics has been designed conservatively is to go with a reputable brand. Um, uh, uh, one other approach is to make a lot of noise when you uh, uh, find yourself repairing something at a restart party or a repair cafe and find that things have been not conservatively rated. Um, and you, you get a lot of very cheap electronics coming along with fantastic performance specs. They do all kinds of whizzy things, um, but the, the, the price you pay for that is they're not going to last. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, any follow-up comments to that, please, in, in, in the chat. Um, oh, the, interestingly, the ethical question about, you know, whether, yeah. whether manufacturers uh, consciously um, send kit out with short lifetimes. Um, uh, I, I, I know from personal experience that at least one manufacturer does um, having, having been a, a design engineer for that company and being told as I think I said in the forum uh, I, I, I took him a design where, where I had really made sure the electronics was going to last and he said this is much too expensive go away and start taking bits out until it stops working and then put the last bit back um, and I refused but it didn't do my promotion prospects any good <laughs> I remember that conversation yeah <laughs> it was also good to hear from uh a current product designer who seems to have a different approach, which is really yeah. Well, I'm very glad, um, yeah. but uh, yeah, ethics in manufacturing, yes, uh, that's a much bigger question than capacitors. Um, and in your opinion, do you think it's worth uh, a legis legislation um, in order to try and force companies and manufacturers to be a bit more uh, conservative in their rating of capacitors? And um, well, we, we we've we've seen this happening in Kenya, where they've they've actually you know they, because there's so little uh, indigenous manufacturing, they can say. Um, okay, we will check everything at the border um, and make sure that it's got a testing certificate from a recognized test body that says these things have been tested. Um, uh, and it has had the effect of uh, raising the standard of electronics in, in, in Kenya, I'm glad to say. Um, but also that the, there's still 80% or more of the electronics in Kenya seems to be unbranded. Um, uh, so there's, there's still a long, long way to go. But yeah, I mean, you could have the same law in this country, couldn't you? You say, um, you know, uh, equipment is tested for safety, but it's not tested for longevity at all. Um, uh, and that is something that could be changed. The, one of the challenges, uh, I mean, I, I've been on the other side of the fence as well. Um, as a manufacturer, you know, you, you rush to get something out to market, you build your prototypes, and then you think, oh, crikey, we've got to send it off to the test house to be tested. Um, and the test house is going to take six weeks oh no, now another six weeks delay before we can get this thing out to market. Well, six weeks is not long enough to test the longevity of a product. Um, but you know, even so, it, it really hurts the manufacturer to have to wait so long because his competitors got a product out there already, you know? Um, really, you'd like a test house to, to test something and prove that it's gonna last for years, but how do you do that quickly? Um, do, you have any, do you have any ideas on that? Um, well, I mean, the, the way the way it in practice is done is it's done with accelerated aging. You say you use the thing called the Arrhenius rate equation, and you say, okay, well, if it's going to uh, last, uh, if it's going to last ten years at uh, at uh, fifty degrees C, then it'll probably only last one year at one hundred degrees C, and hopefully, you know, maybe only six months at one hundred and twenty degrees C. So we'll run it at one hundred and fifty degrees C and see if it fails in a week, uh, and if so, we'll say it's probably okay. You know, that's the kind of reasoning that's done. But it's it's a very imperfect science. And is that currently um, is that kind of uh, technology or that method used to test the longevity of, of capacitors? In, in yeah, I mean, yeah. How, how else do you do it? You know. Okay. Um, yeah. you, you produce some kind of curve which shows lifetime versus temperature, uh, and you extrapolate it and say, okay, well, you know, like I can blow this thing up in only a week at, at, at two hundred volts, um, so it's only going to run at fifty volts. So uh, you know extending the curve out to 10 years, yeah, it should make it. Um, and that's how you do it. Um, but it, yeah, it's not very good, is it? Um, okay, uh, I'm just gonna read through the question queue again, the talking yeah. stack. Um, we have a comment from the person who was talking about the Carlson low voltage capacitor tester earlier, mm. um, and a bit of a description about what that is. So I'll just read that out briefly. Um, so this person says the Carlson low voltage capacitor tester is a low voltage form of the old fashioned and dangerous high voltage leakage capacitor <laughs> testers, which charge and measure capacitors up to about 600 volts or more. Um, and this person, potentially Keith, uh, could you confirm that Keith? 
uh, highly recommends Mr. Carlson's lab as a source of excellent knowledge and test circuits uh, on YouTube and Patreon. Um, yes, that was from Keith. Great. Um, I, I should say that, that this, this you know, 16 pound tester is, is not intended to be a rigorous thing. It's just intended to tell you, is it worth desoldering this capacitor and testing it properly? You know, um, uh, and, and there it's a, a very quick and easy thing to do. Um, and you know, if, if you suspect, suspect the capacitor, well, you know, put a new one in if you've got one and see if the thing works. It only costs what, 20 pence or something. Um, that's, yeah, a good suggestion. Um, OK, I think we're I think that's probably about it for questions at the moment. If anyone has any more questions for Chris before we finish, uh, it's now or never. So feel free to put them in the chat. <laughs> Um, well, we've had quite a lively dialogue on the forum, and that can continue. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, the conversations from the session absolutely can continue on the, the Restarters forum, where they've already been going on for a while. Um, and perhaps somebody can post a link to that in the chat. Um, and yeah, Joe makes an observation that uh, as an occasional repair person, it's useful to have uh, a little set of capacitors um, of different capacities that you can use to replace broken components. Um, but you need actually of... quite a large set to, to, to cater for every situation. Yeah. As, as we've learned today, there are all kinds of, all yeah. kinds of capacitors out there. For low value capacitors, you can buy pretty amazing kits of capacitors from China for not very much, but you know, goodness knows what their lifetime is. Actually, that leads perfectly on to um, two final questions, first from Janet and then from Paul. Um, which is about where to source quality replacement parts. Uh, where do you find yours and how do you stock your repair cafe with replacement capacitors and so on? Um, okay, um, uh, typically um, from RS components or Farnell, um, harder to source components from uh, Mauser or DigiKey. Um, uh, CRC, which is also part of Farnell, isn't it? Uh, CPC, which is part of Farnell as well. Um, th th those are good sources. Um, uh, and, and their components will be good. Um, although um, I don't think RS sells long life components, uh, 10,000 hour uh, capacitors. They'd probably have to come from one of the more specialist distributors. Uh, perfect. And in terms of the range of values that you tend to stock, obviously you mentioned that it's very difficult to stock all of them, but what yeah. do you tend to go for? What are the more common? Um, well, um, stocking 100 nanofarad safety capacitors is easy um uh, uh, uh x2 rating um uh, and and maybe one or ten nanofarad y2 rating capacitors is, is worth doing although they don't fail as often um uh, electrolytics um i have a selection of values but uh, i i still find more than half the cases it needs a, a special order um so uh, yeah it's, it's it's frustrating that um what, what I, I mean, one of the components I do store a stock of, though, um, is 600 volt, 6 amp triax, because they blow up so often and they're so common in light dimmers and food mixers and uh, electric drills and goodness knows what. Um, Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we're just about out of time. Um, but as we said, this conversation is just getting started and Chris will be on the forum along with um, plenty of other repairers. Uh, so feel free to continue the conversation there. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for You're giving us your Saturday morning to take us through the world of capacitors. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's come. It looks like we had about uh, kind of 28 people or so following along, Great, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so thank you, everybody. The next fixed session is happening on Thursday, where we'll be exploring quality online engagement with adult learners. So we'll be discussing online events, particularly in light of coronavirus um, and ways that we can teach repair and other skills uh, through an online medium. So if, please, everybody, if you're interested in that, come along on Thursday. That starts at 8 p.m. UK time on Thursday. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks again, Chris. Great, thank you. <laughs> until the next time. Thank you, bye-bye.